This video is sponsored by Mel Chemistry, an awesome monthly subscription with fun, educational, and safe experiments for kids and parents to do at home. It comes with everything you need to get started, plus 90 experiments on over 30 chemistry topics delivered right to your door. Click the link below to get 25% off your first month, and make sure you stay tuned for a chance to win a free subscription at the end of the video. One of the most important developments in human history was the discovery of different metals that can be shaped and used for a variety of tools and weapons. Metal tools were much stronger and usually easier to produce than any previous stone tools. One of the most useful early metals discovered was the alloy of copper and tin, bronze. The challenge of this alloy though is that it combines two fairly rare elements that are not found together in many places in the world. I've previously managed to collect raw copper ore in California and process it into copper metal. However, the much more rare tin has remained elusive. So a few months ago, I took a trip to England, one of the few areas of the world with this metal, and see if I could get a hold of some ore to extract my own tin from. Tin, somewhere over there. But first, while in the country, I started in London to talk a little more in depth about metals with author Lewis Dartnell. I previously talked with him only over the internet when he previously encouraged me to make eyeglasses and eventually a camera. Can you even see me? Can you see anything at all through those glasses? I can see a little bit of light, that's about it. <laughs> Based on his research, for his informative book, The Knowledge. So one of the challenges with uh, Bronze Age is copper and tin to different compounds you need to alloy, yeah, yeah, yeah. but there's very few places in the world where they're found in the same spot. Thank you, Yan. You're letting me plug all of my books. <laughs> <laughs> this fits in much more closely to my most recent book, to Origins, How the Earth Made Us. I look at different ways that features of the planet that we live on have directed the course of, of human history. One of the earliest uh, stages of that, of that technological innovation was the Bronze Age. And to make bronze as an alloy, you need copper, and you need tin. But frustratingly, both of them are relatively rare. Mm -hmm. And even more irritatingly, to mix them together, they often turn up in different places. Geologically, a lot of copper is laid down in mid-ocean spreading ridges. When two tectonic plates are moving apart from each other, and a lot of the kind of magma wells up to fill the gap, you get a lot of hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. That is happening right now in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and those hydrothermal vents, those black smokers, dissolve out a lot of metals from the crust, squirt them out, dissolve into the seawater, where they then suddenly get very cold, they precipitate out, and you get this kind of mineral drizzle onto the seafloor, which is great because there's high density of metals that you need, but that is about the most inaccessible place for humans to actually be able to find it. So you need to wait tens of million years later for that seafloor to have then been lifted up and dumped on top of continental crust. And that often happens in what's known as an ophiolite. Whereas a lot of the tin we think for Mediterranean Bronze Age was from Cornwall, <laughs> here yeah. under grey skies <laughs> in Britain. And if you mix together that copper and that tin, you get this particular mixture called bronze, which is relatively easy to cast. It's relatively easy to kind of cold forge and hammer into, into different tools. But it's also particularly soft and it loses its edge, its edge very quickly. And that was one of the main reasons why we then moved on to iron and steel. After getting a little context from Lewis, I headed out to the southwest most tip of England to visit one of the last tin mines in Cornwall and see if I could finally get some tin. So this is the St. Just Mining District. The mine that you're visiting here at the moment is Giva Tin Mine. And Giva was the last mine to actually work the, the St. Just Mining District, finally closing in, in 1990. And it's the, uh, the big, largest abundance in the world of undersea tin mines. So what we've actually got here at Giva is a more or less complete 20th century Cornish mine. I'm a mining engineer by profession, um, worked in various parts of the world. I walk around here now and I recognize, yeah, it's just, it's a mine that um, could feasibly reopen um, with all the equipment that we've actually got here. I mean, the history of mining in Cornwall probably goes back about 4,000 years due to the sort of incidences of tin and copper in this part of the world. To the mining activity that, that occurred um, up until probably about 500 years ago was all surface stuff where they were actually mining from streams and things like that. In this part of the world, if you go down to the cliffs over there, because obviously the sea's just down there, um, you can see the actual tin and copper loads in the actual cliffs themselves. So the guys then started to mine into the cliffs as well. So underground mining activity probably started about 500 years ago. The significance of Cornish mining, Cornish people emigrated to 
to all corners of the world, taking the mining technology with them. One of those such corners of the world is actually back at my home in Minnesota, where I've previously toured a iron mine there that these same Cornish miners had traveled over to help begin in the first place. A lot of the early miners here were actually Cornish, so some of the terms come from, from that group that started. I can take you around and show you what we got here. Yeah. So the workings we're going to go into, uh, they're going to be pretty tight because in the era we're talking about, the guys actually mined the minimum width. Yeah. Anything outside of the, the tin load was, was waste material. That there, that beautiful archway, that's the original entrance to the mine. So that would have been the side of the hill. Okay, now when the, This is the high part. <laughs> Ow. 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 So the guys are actually following, when my light is shining here, it's a very, very narrow tin load uh, in the hope of finding something of significance. There was very little to be found in this, uh, in, in the actual load structure here. You can see these quartz here. Now, all of these tunnels we're going through were all developed by hand with a hammer and a chisel. They gave up on this mineral load here, turned off to the west, and the guys were looking for the next mineral load. There's the next mineral load here. That's tin ore? Yeah. There's tin ore in that. Again, just because you found a tin load, it doesn't mean that you've actually got economic values of tin that you can mine. All of the rock was mined by hand, and that would have been carried to the shaft here by youngsters. Boys working perhaps at the age of eight or nine, they started working underground. They bring it to a shaft in a hand barrow like this. A lot of women worked uh, on the surface in Cornish mines. They were known as bow maidens. Bow, B-A-L, is the Cornish word for a mine. This is all in some of the hardest rock known. It's the hardest Cornish granite. This was developed following a, a very narrow tin load here. It's only a few inches wide. But they then started to follow it in here, and at last, um, they actually found some good values to actually mine. They then started to mine upwards towards the surface. Just a small example of the underground workings from this era. There are hundreds of miles of tunnels like this. So that's how tin was mined in the 1800s. Next, I got a tour of how tin has been mined in the modern era. But first, while tin was an important mineral for making bronze in the past, today, tin is more often utilized for its protective coating ability in such things as tin cans, which are actually made from steel and are then electroplated with tin on the surface. Once you have tin metal, this can be done pretty easily by dissolving the tin in hydrochloric acid. Then attaching the item you want to have plated to the cathode and running a current through the solution. The tin will then form on the surface of the item. If you end up spacing out the electrodes, you can actually create these really cool tin crystals that grow out of it. If you think that's cool, you want to try it out yourself, or as a fun activity to do with your niece or nephew, you may want to check out the sponsor of today's video. I'm going to do the tin experiment set from Mel Chemistry. I'm going to do the tin dendrite. Step one, first prepare the tin chloride solution by adding the sodium hydrogen sulfate to the tin 2 chloride. I'll put it in my petri dish. To make the liquid distribute evenly, we need to decrease its surface tension by adding some liquid soap. Put the electrodes on the solution, red on one side, black on another side of the petri dish. Once I run the current through that, it will make the tin dendrite tree. Stay tuned for your chance to win a free subscription at the end of the video. Now, back to getting a hold of my own tin. But first, I need to learn how the ore was collected, processed, and refined, so I can attempt to apply all that myself. When they started sinking Victory Shaft, which is just in front of us here, uh, they started sinking that in about 1919. So it's, uh, it's 100 years old uh, this year. They decided in May 91 to, to shut the mine. And then basically the mine flooded from the bottom upwards. The tin loads here were nearly vertical. So the guys drilled a pattern of holes, perhaps 28, 30 holes. The holes were then charged up with dynamite, electric detonators. And at the end of the morning shift, the rounds were actually blasted. Then the miners came underground in the morning shift and then use a mucker like this, and that was then used to clear the broken rock. Probably about 20 tons or so per blast. The broken rock was lifted, thrown into a wagon that had been attached to it. Then the wagons went off back to the shaft to dump the material. The rock that came up from underground went through the primary crusher, washed to remove fine material. The rest of the stuff here was then sent to the secondary crusher, which then crushed it down to about pebble size. That material then went to the heavy media separation plant where the obvious waste was floated off and then the ore pebbles themselves, they then went to the, the ball mill. So the pebbles of ore was fed in at one end. As the drum turned, the steel balls ground down the pebbles into sand 
uh, thereby liberating the, uh, the small particles of, of tin. And that material was then sent to shaking tables, uh, treated about 11 tonnes of material an hour. On the tables, it was the main uh, method of, of separation. What we do is we chuck some sand onto the table, the slope of the table and the flow of water. The lighter material gets washed off the table and the heavier, denser concentrate is directed to a compartment of the table here. There we have the heavy minerals present there. Glorified prospector's pan, that's what it is. Concentrate that came off that was then put through a heavy media magnetic separator. And in the mag set, particles pass through here, the iron oxide being magnetic, the tin not, and then basically the, uh, the, the, the citrate, the tin oxide, pass through there into these two dryers here and it was almost a pure tin concentrate running at about 70% um, tin and that was put into 50 kilogram bags and that was then uh, every 20 ton pallet was then sent off uh, the mine to be to be smelted. So is it pretty rare to find just a rock of cassiterite in these areas or? It is it is indeed possible to find stuff like that just look down here a minute and we'll have a look at the ore pile I can't promise you there'll be much in it um, I don't know. Well, this stuff here, this pile of rock here, has the distinction of being the, the last ore that ever came up from underground at yeah. Gave. It was never processed. It had been stockpiled, never went through the mill. They'd shut the mill down by then. So it was moved down here. So it has extreme rarity value, but to determine whether in fact some of this stuff contains tin or not, it's not easy to determine. Now that is potentially promising. Um, so take that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see, it's, you can see that it's glistening. It's, it's in the granite post rock, but I mean, if I turn it round, you can see crystals glistening there. Now, it could be tourmaline, it could be, it could be cassiterite. Uh, the only way to really find out, of course, to have an assay. Yeah. But it is an example of what came up from underground here. So I'm back in Cornwall, and I have the little bit of ore I was able to take back with me. Basically, I'm gonna do the same process they do, and break this up, small pieces, and extract as much tin as possible. And they said it was at least 1% tin, so it might not be much. We'll see what we can get. Let's smash some stuff. Little piece. It might take a little longer than I was hoping. Close enough. <laughs> Next, panned any heavy elements, then ran through a strong magnet several times to remove any iron impurities. then baked it at a low temp to break down any other impurities that then might dissolve and be separated by straining. Lastly, combined it in an alternating layers of charcoal and baked it under high heat. This should hopefully reduce the tin ore in an oxygen deprived environment, resulting in pure tin. Once cooled, I smashed up the slag to see if I could find any pockets of tin. Obviously this wasn't the highest yield, but now I know the process required to make more tin. And so now that I have tin, I can combine it with copper, which I previously sourced, to make bronze, which is actually a really strong alloy, much stronger than either one by itself. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to make a few different knives out of tin, out of copper, and then out of them combined to form bronze. So let's melt them down and make some knives. my casting so I didn't quite get great results but should have enough to test 
So I have the fully tin butter knife, copper butter knife, and bronze. Got them ground down to roughly the same thickness. It's pretty easy to see the difference between them. So this is the 10, which is super easy to bend. It's really good if you want like a curved piece of butter. It's like barely even a metal. It's like a rubber knife. The copper is a lot harder, but I can still bend it with a little bit of force. And then the bronze, ugh, I can't even bend it, even a touch. So I'm gonna do a super scientific test of dropping a hammer on them and seeing how much they bend, just to compare them. All right, safety glass is on. I'm gonna drop this two pound hammer from about five inches above. That uh, bent it. So as you can tell from my scientific test, they all bent to varying degrees. The tin is very bent, copper somewhat bent, and the bronze just a little bit. So it doesn't really compare to a modern steel, which probably wouldn't have bent at all, but uh, early steel was about comparable to this. So this is actually pretty good and will make a pretty decent tool. Not as great as anything today, but something you can work with. Up to this point, I've drawn a line and make my own tools for my projects. But now that I have this missing ingredient, I finally feel like it may be the time to discard this exception and restart things from the bottom up and change the overall rules of this channel. In preparation, I also filmed with some experts in England from starting in the Stone Age, progressing into bronze, and then onto iron, and eventually into my own industrial revolution. As Louis Darnell also happened to challenge me to yet a new difficult task. A car and the internal combustion engine clearly are very, very difficult things, but stepping back be a steam engine, and that possibly wouldn't be all that hard. I would love to see a steam engine that you have built from scratch. <laughs> I'll be explaining more of this change in the scope of our channel as we officially launch it in about a month or so, hopefully. But first we'll be wrapping up a few projects we already have started. I filmed a few conversations with Louis Darnell that you can look forward to in some future episodes. But be sure to check out both of his books, The Knowledge About How to Rebuild Society from the Ground Up, and his latest book, Origins. And the idea behind this book, moving on from the knowledge and looking at how you know, human ingenuity and resourcefulness and, and discoveries made, made the modern world. But zooming out even further and looking at how different features of, of planet Earth itself have directed the course of, of human history. So right back to our very origins as an exquisitely intelligent ape through thousands of years of the history of civilization and even to the modern day of politics and, and current affairs, you can still see the imprint of, of the Earth behind all that. Thanks again to Mel Science for sponsoring this video. Here's your chance to win a six month subscription to the Mel Chemistry Kits. Here are the three winners from our previous quiz. To enter to win, just answer the question in the comments. Tin has a much lower melting point than most other metals. What is the melting point of tin? You can give your answer in either Fahrenheit or centigrade. In a couple weeks, we'll do a random drawing to select three lucky winners. If you're too eager to wait to see if you won, click the link below to get 25% off your first month subscription to Mail Chemistry. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.